Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. I see some familiar faces uh, from work we've done together in the past. It's nice to see people in other settings. Um, I'm a bit, I have a bit of stage fright. So if I speak too quickly or I start me, don't, not making that much sense, stop me and I will repeat myself. Um, so, um, as Maya mentioned, um, I did some research on access to palliative care for older adults experiencing homelessness in Montreal. Um, it was in the context of my master's degree. So, instead of doing a clinical field placement, uh, I was allowed to do my own self-directed project um, to kind of create uh, education tools for providers on this issue. I'm still working on the education tool, but this is uh, the, the results. And I'm hoping to continue further to get more uh, information as well um, over the course of the next year. So, um, so this is one of the quotes uh, from one of the participants. I thought it was a nice way to start. It was thinking, it was a question related to um, what aging in place might mean in the context of aging and dying in place might mean in the context of homelessness. So this participant said, so I think that what it means is that a home might be a shelter or a home might be a boat and home might be a housing facility with staff and those staff might be that person's family. And so we as a society and as a healthcare system have to be flexible to be able to meet that need and recognize that it's not inherently risky and it's not inherently unsafe for a person to like we can make it work, you know? So I thought that was a, a nice kind of picture of, uh, of the study. Um, so a bit of a background. Um, likely a lot of you already know some of this information, but uh, just as a backgrounder. So, um, demographic trends in Canada um, point to an ever-growing proportion of older adults. So, um, you know, Canada's population is aging and people over the age of 65 currently account for 16% of the overall Canadian population. That's expected to increase um, dramatically. Um, Canadians are living longer, um, though they're doing so more often with chronic life-limiting uh, conditions that impact their quality of life. Um, largely, there's you know a lot of new technologies um, that life-saving technologies and treatments that increase people's uh, longevity. So that um, has been changing. Um, so and at the same time, although uh, Canada has a universal healthcare system, um, access to palliative care uh, remains fragmented and varies significantly uh, both within within provinces and between provinces. So. You know, from, from the city to rural areas, for example, it changes a lot, or even from one neighborhood to another, it can change. Um, and then access looks very different between provinces and territories as well. Um, so, um, in terms of homelessness and palliative care, um, so um, I found that uh, access to palliative care is stratified along socioeconomic lines. So, you know, people that experience more poverty have are less likely to be able to access palliative care, specialist palliative care, um, especially earlier on. Um, homeless and marginally housed individuals experience high levels of need for palliative care services because there's a, a lot more chronic illnesses, a lot more complex chronic issues, um, uh, but they experience vastly disproportionate barriers to accessing care. Um, and so while some Canadian cities have started developing strategies, um, those strategies are happening as independent initiatives from organizations um, and not as any kind of coordinated strategy um, on provincial or federal levels. So these, there's some really important, exciting things happening, which I'll explain uh, later on, which is part of some of the results that I found. Um, but as I mentioned, those, those are initiatives that were spearheaded by individuals, organizations, and uh, so Montreal has many community organizations geared at supporting homeless individuals, um, several of which have a focus on health care provision. Um, but I found that there were no specialized palliative care resources that currently exist in Montreal for uh, older homeless adults. Um, so the objective of the study uh, was to add, um, to trace the avenues through which homeless older adults access palliative and end-of-life care services in Montreal. Um, to assess the facilitators and barriers to accessing services, 
and to provide tangible recommendations for improving services um, and policy development in a Montreal context. So that was generally what I was hoping to do. Um, and so methodology, as I mentioned, um, it was part of a self-directed, I didn't do the thesis stream of the, of the master's program, it was really um, a field placement that was aimed at uh, creating resources and building capacity and understanding what the issues are. Um, and Victoria here was uh, supervising me along with Tamara Sussman, who some of you may know. Um, so um, ethics approval was obtained from the McGill University Research Ethics Board. Um, so I first started um, with uh, document analysis and literature review. I read uh, all the uh, academic literature I could find on the issue. Um, I reviewed policies, uh, provincial, federal policies. Um, I also looked at a lot of gray literature because there's not, it's becoming more researched recently. It's an area that's really, uh, if you, you look online more and more, every time I check, there's more research coming out about it, but it's still quite limited. Um, so I also looked at a lot of gray literature, looked at uh, different organizations. Uh, there, you know, some organizations put out like, different uh, resources for providers and different things like this. So I read that, watched webinars, listened to podcasts, lots of different things like that. Um, then I developed the interview guides uh, for some instructor's interviews. Um, two of them were initially developed, one for palliative care service providers and one for the homelessness sector. And then I made a third one for experts in the field and researchers because I also uh, spoke with researchers. Um, so sampling and recruitment. I did snowball sampling. Uh, so I really uh, contacted people that I, you know, had read about organizations I uh, knew worked around these issues and asked them if they would participate and if they knew people that had uh, expertise in the field. And I interviewed 11 people over the course of the summer. And I also did a three-day clinical observership um, of a mobile palliative care program uh, geared at homelessness. Um, to understand further what the different issues were. Um, and then finally, uh, I took notes during and immediately following the interviews, and we listened to audio recordings to transcribe relevant quotes and pull out additional themes I may have missed, and then had lengthy conversations with Victoria and Tamara to kind of sort through all the data um, and pull out additional themes. Um, so service availability, so as I mentioned, I found no specialized palliative care resources geared specifically at homeless individuals in Montreal. Um, uh, research participants stated they felt that most homeless individuals that uh, die in acute care hospital settings due to a lack of appropriate and respectful services geared particularly at their needs. Um, research participants identified some HIV specific resources that do have a mandate to work specifically around homelessness. But as more treatments become available for HIV, that's not necessarily the primary cause of death. Um, so, you know, there needs to be more resources geared not only at, you know, very specific uh, conditions um, for homeless individuals. Uh, homeless health uh, specific initiatives exist, but they generally do, don't focus on palliative care specifically. Um, and there's an increase in shelter-based health clinics, uh, which is great, um, but again, there isn't a specific focus on palliative care. Um, and there's, we found one shelter that opened a specialized housing complex here to be housing older homeless adults with chronic health issues. Um, so those, that's what I found, but nothing like specifically mandated to work around palliative care and homelessness. Um, so after that, I was really asking a lot of the participants what they felt the barriers and facilitators to care were in terms of accessing uh, palliative care services for homeless older adults. Um, so uh, one of the biggest ones that came out uh, was the focus on place-based service provision and um, those and the assumption that people have a very traditional home-like environment in which care could be provided. Um, more and more, the focus on um, aging in place and dying in place, which is, you know, it, it, there's research that shows that uh, that's the preference of a lot of individuals, but there's not a lot of flexibility in terms of what home might mean to someone. Um, so 
so that acts as a really major barrier for people trying to access services. Um, Sorry about that. Um, so the other one was the assumption that people who need care have an informal family caregiver to supplement care, especially when it's provided at home. Um, a lot of the times, uh, you know, workers rely on family members or friends to provide care when they're not there, um, supplemental care, especially, and also um, to coordinate care for individuals. And if people don't have that, it could be very, very difficult to, to provide uh, palliative care at home or in people's own environment. Um, but also, people that work in residential hospice uh, facilities also talked about um, the need for to have an informal caregiver. It's not an absolute need. It's not a requirement. But they do rely on, on families a lot also in those environments uh, to organize, especially uh, after someone passes away, they may not have uh, you know, a morgue on site or different things like this. So treatment of the body afterwards, they really rely on family often. So without that, it can be quite challenging. Um, another major one that came out was stereotypes and negative perceptions of homelessness. Um, so people talked about um, there's widespread, uh, you know, attitudes um, about homeless patients and stereotypes um, that impact the ways that people are treated in health and social service settings um, that, you know, impact the way that they, uh, that they are treated. Um, they also often have unique realities and in terms of care uh, that make it that are often not understood by service providers. Um, research participants highlighted prevailing stereotypes uh, yeah, that I mentioned uh, that also impact how people understand people's quality of life and whether or not they might want intervention or how, how much, what kind of uh, interventions they might want for themselves. Um, so, uh, and also many homeless individuals uh, avoid accessing health and social services for fear of being treat judged or treated unfairly or misunderstood uh, by healthcare providers. And those, it ends up kind of being a vicious cycle, you know, where those, where those kinds of stereotypes impact people's, uh, you know, what they're feeling about whether or not they feel comfortable accessing care and then they're Providers sense that, and then it ends up being this kind of vicious cycle that uh, that a lot of providers talked about. Um, so that is what we found in terms of stigma and negative perceptions. Um, also, uh, substance use and stigmatizing attitudes towards substance users. Almost all the professionals, actually every single one that I interviewed, talked about substance use um, and stigmatizing attitudes towards substance users as one of the major barriers um, to care. So, um, for instance, especially because palliative care has such a focus on pain management um, and the use of opioids to manage that pain. So if someone was, for instance, an opioid user um, that was using illicit drugs beforehand, some providers might feel like they don't necessarily understand what their pain tolerance is, feel like they're drug seeking when they're asking for needed medication, and that creates frustration for the patient because they end up not getting the, the care they need or they feel like they're being um, treated like they're lying or, you know, when they're, when they're asking for needed pain medication. And at the same time, there doesn't seem to be, uh, participants mentioned that they, there doesn't seem to be um, protocols for pain management for people that were opioid users prior to uh, needing palliative care. Um, so, you know, pain issues might be different. Uh, how much you need to give to people uh, might increase. Also, uh, the ways that people react to pain. Uh, a lot of these things are really misunderstood. Um, so that's a major barrier. Um, and, yeah. So that was one of the major ones. Um, another one that people mentioned was hidden costs. It really depends on the province, too. Uh, some medications that aren't necessarily covered in some provinces, people talked about uh, daily fees for uh, especially hospice, like residential hospice facilities, if people needed different, different kinds of uh, things that aren't covered. 
Um, so there are these hidden costs and the expectation and assumption that people have the finances to supplement uh, what is provided um, through the public system. Um, mental health issues and stigma against people with mental health issues uh, was another issue that came up um, as a major barrier. Um, so we found uh, similarly with uh, substance use, obviously not all uh, homeless individuals are substance users but uh, or have mental health issues, but research has shown that it is uh, disproport those are issues that disproportionately impact homeless individuals or people experiencing homelessness. Um, or, and as well, there's often the assumption that there's mental health issues or substance use issues, even if there isn't necessarily um, coming from uh, health and social service providers when working with people that have mental health issues. Um, so often people's behaviors or ways that they express themselves will be seen as, you know, aggressive or uh, uncooperative or different things like this, um, and that will impact the care that they receive or whether or not um, they can go to a hospice facility or stay there because their behaviors might be seen as disruptive or things like that. Um, and then some people also talked about the challenges of, in terms of mental health of, um, you know, understanding when people's articulations of their, of their illnesses or symptoms that, uh, for instance, we had, um, I'll have a quote here that really, that really uh, sums that up. So one participant uh, said, street people are marginalized and street people who have mental illness are really marginalized. I'll give you an example. I had a woman uh, come in who died of stage four breast cancer. She had been living under a bridge downtown and she was quite mentally ill. Outreach workers were checking in with her when they saw her downtown and they would say to her, you know, what's up with you today? How are you feeling? And she would say things like, when I slept last night, my heart was moving all over my chest and it really hurt. And I didn't know what, was, what that was all about, but I could hear it. And then she would take off and they wouldn't see her again. Um, and they would try to find her and say, do you want to go to the doctor? No, I don't want to go to the doctor. My heart is just doing these strange things at night and I don't understand that. This was in the winter, so she had many layers of clothes on. In the summer, she was wearing a tank top and they could see that there was a tumor on her breast the size of a grapefruit. And that's what she was expressing to them. I have this tumor. But she was expressing it in a way that everyone was saying, you know, she's mentally ill and that's part of her mental illness. And of course, her heart isn't jumping all over her chest. So when she came in, well, you know, I'm not faulting them either. You know, it's a very complicated situation. And so when she came in to us, she was stage four and she died within, I think she was with us for about three months. So this kind of, uh, it came up a couple times in the interviews where people mentioned uh, the difficulty in sometimes identifying uh, people's symptoms. Um, another issue is the complexity of care needs and non-linear illness trajectories. People talked about, um, you know, there's not a very clear progression. People might might not present uh, to to healthcare until it's already very late uh, in their in their illness. And at that point, it's very complex, and there's multiple health issues going on. Um, so that is one of the big issues that people talked about. Um, another one was lack of capacity to provide palliative care in the homelessness sector, and um, a lack of understanding around palliative care issues uh, in shelters and homelessness-specific issues. So these are people that are, you know, closest to a lot of uh, homeless community. They see people on a daily basis and are well positioned to see pe changes in people's health status, but they don't have necessarily a lot of understanding or are not well equipped uh, to understand those kinds of issues and when to, to, you know, kind of talk to patients about seeking further care. Um, so that was one of them. Um, and satellite service provision also came up a lot. So um, everything being very uh, profile oriented. So you have mental health, you have homelessness, you have, uh, you have home care, and if somebody falls uh, within various uh, various profiles, it may be very difficult and they don't necessarily know what to do with people that don't fall neatly within one, one area or another. Um, and rigid professional boundaries came up too. You know, a lot of professionals were all told, you know, this, these are your roles. This is, these, you know, you have to set boundaries in these particular ways. These are things you can do, you shouldn't be doing. Um, and that creates a lot of, uh, you know, I think it's often felt by individuals as being cold and insensitive. Um, and also 
the needs are different. If people are very isolated and they may, you know, need things that are beyond the, the, our traditional uh, roles that are defined by wherever we work or our professional orders, um, it, could be a, it could be a bit difficult. Um, and then another one that I found very interesting was a false dichotomy between harm reduction and palliative care. So on the one hand, uh, harm reduction, uh, people that work primarily in harm reduction fields uh, feel like they've had to fight so hard to prove harm reduction saves lives. Um, and that, you know, to, to validate the need for harm reduction approaches. And so to, to collaborate with palliative care services sometimes is a bit challenging because they're constantly having to prove that, you know, this is, this is an approach that saves lives. And then on the other hand, we have palliative care um, services that are maybe a bit reticent around harm reduction and being like, especially if someone, especially this is the case if, um, Someone, someone's condition is related uh, to to their substance use. Then um, professionals might feel like you know they have to abstain from use. Uh, otherwise, uh, like they may not be palliative if they if they abstain from using, um, but may not understand uh, that people may not be able or willing to 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 stop using. Um, so that was a pretty a pretty interesting. Um, for me, because I also have uh, a background working in harm reduction, so I found that particularly uh, interesting. Because I see such a, a natural, um, like, I feel like they go very well together, palliative care and and harm reduction. So I found that to be such a an interesting observation. Um, and then top down decision making and agenda setting. So people talked about how um, professionals on the ground. They might see issues come up, so we might see that yes, there's a lack of services uh, in, palliative, in palliative care for homeless individuals. But as uh, frontline service providers, we're not always given, or more and more, not given the opportunity to to set the agenda and say these are the needs and we need services. We're told from above what the needs are and how to address them. So even though we're seeing issues, we can't always uh, act to change things on a systems or organizational level. Um, so this was another quote, uh, what happens if you don't have a home? What happens if you're living in a shelter? What happens if you're living under a bridge or living in a vehicle or all of those things or living on a boat as one of our participants was? What happens then? How do people get that care? Um, so uh, I also looked at facilitators, so I you know it seems very dire at the moment, but people had a lot to say also about uh, what could improve access. I'm just going to check on the screen later. Okay. So um, the first one was education and training in both clinical health settings and the homelessness sector. So they feel like you know both sides, and there needs to be a lot more education um, all around around uh, access and what barriers and facilitators are, and the different issues that people experience. Um, integrated upstream access to palliative care. So you know not seeing pal palliative care only as this thing that happens at the end of life. Um, that you know, people should be able to access palliative care as soon as they have a diagnosis, and that it would really benefit people throughout their illness trajectory. Um, and this is especially true, they felt, in terms of homelessness, um, being able to provide that support, and also alongside treatment. It doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other, that you can have both at the same time. Um, low threshold harm reduction approaches, so that was a very big one that came up, is that um, we need to be able to integrate harm reduction approaches into palliative care settings um, and uh, make it as flexible and low barrier as possible so that people are able to access the services they need, um, whether or not they're, they're using uh, substances. Non-judgmental, strengths-based, and relational care provision. So this was kind of in response to um, the rigid professional boundaries. Uh, that having a really strengths-based um, relational approach is very, very important, and people are more, uh, maybe more open to to receiving care uh, if you have this kind of approach. Um, Community-based advanced care planning, so you know, encouraging people to to state their wishes, uh, to formalize that. Um, but for that to happen not in the context of an emergency, you know, when that happens in a hospital or when there's a health crisis, people often feel that uh, when this conversation comes up that 
you know, they don't place value on my life and that's where they, why they're, you know, trying to have this conversation with me at this point and they may feel um, self-protective. But to have this conversation in the community, in shelters, uh, in environments where people are more comfortable going to people where they are and having these conversations um, and being able to provide those, those advanced care plans and, you know, give them to people that, that might come into contact with them is a way for people to advocate for themselves, um, you know, if they do end up in a crisis situation and maybe can't articulate their own needs. Um, building bridges between the community sector and uh, mainstream health and palliative care settings. So a lot of people talked about a real disconnect in between um, the community sector, so I'm thinking more around shelters and community organizations and things like this, and uh, clinical health settings. Um, and that, you know, they're not always communicating and collaborating together. And that collaboration um, and formalizing that collaboration would be a real asset to getting people the care they need. Um, flexible admission criteria and policies, you know, so around prognosis, around need for, um, to be abstaining from, from drug use, uh, zero tolerance policies in terms of behaviors and, and substance use can really act as a barrier, so being more flexible around admission criteria or if you need to have a postal code or an address or something like that to kind of strategize to be a bit more flexible. Um, affordable housing and specialized rehousing initiatives, so really um, finding ways to rehouse people uh, when they come into a situation where they have a life-limiting illness um, so that services can be provided at home, uh, you know, getting people into to, uh, housing. And uh, champions and expert panel, including meaningful leadership from people with lived experience of homelessness. So to really take leadership from people that have experienced homelessness, to have people that are championing this issue um, and bringing it to the attention of people that make decisions and set agendas. Um, and so, I know we're running out of time, um, but so another thing that we looked at, or I looked at, was uh, innovative models um, that exist. Uh, so shelter-based palliative care is something that has been organized. Um, so one of the first, it was one of the first coordinated strategies to respond to the lack of access to care. Um, even without integrate, uh, integrated specialist palliative care services, research uh, that I was looking at beforehand shows that shelters and other low barrier services that provide care to homeless individuals often act as an informal source of end of life care already. Um, so the Ottawa uh, City Mission uh, was one of the first organizations to institutionalize the practice of shelter-based palliative care. Um, and they created the Diane Morrison Hospice. They do some amazing work. So they have a palliative care uh, in, their, in their shelter, attached to their shelter. Um, and so uh, they have a flexible admission criteria, not based on pro prognosis, and a harm reduction approach. Um, so that is one initiative. And another one that I noticed was street outreach palliative care. Um, so now mobile palliative care teams designed specifically to meet the needs of homeless individuals wherever they are. Um, so going to people, um, you know, in shelters, uh, following people, meeting people on the street, meeting people where they are and providing care um, there, um, where people are. Um, and so one of the programs uh, that is um, amazing Toronto's Palliative Education and Care for the Homeless, PEACH. There's a lot of uh, information out there about, about it. There's been some articles written. It's a new program. It's been very successful. Um, so it was uh, out of ICHA, um, Inner City Health Associates, and they saw this need and started this program. Um, they have an alternative uh, payment agreement for physicians, so they pay by the hour. So that really helps retain the physicians um, in the program. So. Um, in, in, also, in addition to direct service provision, they also do a lot of education in the homelessness sector and in palliative care, uh, set in traditional palliative care settings. Um, and they also have an early upstream access, so not based on prognosis. They can see the person at the moment uh, they're diagnosed with a life-limiting illness. Um, and they also have a harm reduction approach. And yeah, so that is uh, what I what I what my, my research showed. Um, there was another slide, but I'm not seeing it here. I don't know why it isn't there. But basically, just summing up uh, what I found, uh, and that further research needs to look at a Montreal context in specific, 
And that's what I'm kind of hoping to do over the course of the next year, do some more research, understand what can be done in a Montreal context. If we were to implement one of these models, a street outreach palliative care model, for instance, or a shelter-based palliative care, how would that work here? Where, where would funding come from? How, how would it work? Um, so that's kind of what I'm hoping to focus on in the future. Um, and, you know, my research was limited in many ways. I wasn't able to speak to homeless individuals specifically um, because it was a very short-term project just over the, uh, over the summer. And so, uh, you know, I wasn't able to do that, but I hope to in the future. I think it's very, you know, a very important issue that I would like to continue working on. And, yeah, that's, uh, that's it.